Oh. Right. I don't know what that was, sorry. Um, so, quite looking forward to this, mainly because the bottle looks amazing. This is what the bottle looks like. It's Blade and Bow 22 year old, which you know already because you've just seen the title sequence. So this is the sample that I've got. Uh, and this came from Andrew Watson of the British Bourbon Society. Um, now, I've talked a couple of times about the Stitzel Weller Distillery, which has got a really good reputation, is essentially where um, the Pappy Van Winkles were originally made. W.L. Weller was one of the founders of the distillery, and it's, it's a really, really highly regarded distillery, which was closed down in 1992 by Diageo, who owned the distillery through uh, United Distillers, who owned it previously. In 1992, Diageo closed down the distillery and essentially kind of almost pulled out the bourbon market completely. Completely, excuse me, I've got hiccups. Um, they then went back into bourbon by releasing Bullet Bourbon. And um, they're now looking to move into bourbon in quite a big way and get into the bourbon market because recently, in like the last 10 years, bourbon has really taken off. Big style. It's kind of the in thing at the moment. Um, and in the UK, bourbon's becoming more and more prevalent, hence, you know, British Bourbon Society and Facebook, that sort of thing. So Diageo are like, we, we've got to have some of that. So they've started to um, utilize some of the stocks that they've got in the Stitzel Weller distillery as well as sourcing from elsewhere. For example, Bullet Rye is from the MGP distillery in Indiana. Um, so this is, um, Blade & Bow is a new release that I believe came out last year. And um, there are two versions of it. There is a Blade & Bow non-age statement. Now, they have quite a fancy website for Blade & Bow, and it's worth checking out because it's quite interesting. It's, it's a well-made website, very professional, very Diageo in terms of they've thrown lots of money at it, and it's all very slick. And what they've done with the No Age Statement version is um, they actually had remaining stock of Stitzel Weller whiskey, uh, and they use what's called a Solera system, which is quite... Um, it, it's a system that's used in sherry, whereby... You don't fully empty the cask when you bottle it. What you do is you take a percentage of the cask and you fill it into other casks that you then fill with everything else. So you, you either don't fill it and you, you essentially top it up with new, newer stock or, and the, the way they kind of picture it is you imagine a pyramid. So you've got this cask and you're bottling it out and then some comes out and goes into those ones and some comes out and goes into those ones. And what they're, what they're basically saying is that of the blade and bow whiskey that, that is being made, there is some Stitzel Weller whiskey in there. However much or little that is, there is still some in there and there will be, through the Solera process, there will always be some swimming around as they're moving it from cask to cask to cask and topping it up with everything else. Now, they're being a bit coy in terms of where they're getting this stock from. The Stitzel Weller distillery is now the Bullet Bourbon Experience um, they have reopened it, they are distilling, they're also pumping a load of money into building a new distillery for Bullet itself, um, because Bullet is sourced, um, sourced from elsewhere. Um, so the, the, blade, the blade, blade and bow no age statement, as you know, this is whiskey from elsewhere that we're not actually saying where it's from, um, as well as it's all well a stock that we had that we've sat on that we're using this Solera system to kind of make sure you've got a bit of it in every bottle. Now, Blade and Bow references to a skeleton key and keys are quite a big deal on, on this particular um, release. Um, it's the, the blade is the shaft of the key and the bow is essentially the, the bit at the end of, of a skeleton key. But there, the legend has it, and if you watch one of the videos on the Blade and Bow website, there were five keys that used to hang on the front door of the Stitzel Weller distillery. And these five keys represented the five key components of making whiskey, which is, and I've written it down because I'll forget it, grains, yeast, fermentation, distillation, and aging. And that's what those five keys are. Now, what they're also being very sne clever, sneaky, marketing, cynical, however you want to put it, is the Blade & Bow releases have a key on their bottle and there are five different keys out there, and some are rarer than others. A bit like uh, Blanton's, where you've got the uh, eight different, hang on, B-L-A-N-T-O-N-S, eight, yep, good, I can spell. Eight different horses with um, eight letters on them, and it, you know, 
collect all eight. It's not quite Pokemon Go, but you know there is a collectability to it. And likewise with the blade and bow. And I'll try and put a picture up of a, a close up of the bottle with the key hanging off. Now, I'm a big fan of a graphic novel by um, uh, written by an author um, named Joe Hill. And if you've never come across Joe Hill before, fantastic horror writer who is actually Stephen King's son. So if you like Stephen King books and you've not read any Joe Hill yet, I implore you to read them because he is so much like his dad, it's untrue. Very, very similar writing style. Enough of a character, enough of a um, writing style of his own that he's not a direct um, copycat of his dad. But if you like Stephen King novels, you will probably like Joe Hill novels. But he's quite, he's quite interested in graphic novels and everything like that. And there is a, a set of novels, um, he's written it, it's uh, drawn by a guy called Gabriel Rodriguez, called Lock and Key. And it's a fantastic graphic novel. Uh, there's about eight volumes to it. And it's um, essentially a big house where it's fantasy, there's magic, but there's different keys that do different things. So one turns you into a giant. One actually opens the back of your head. You can take your head off and you can pull out different memories or feelings and that affects your personality. There's one that changes your sex, one that can bring people back from the dead. It's absolutely fantastic. Imaginative, scary, spooky, funny, brilliant stuff, absolutely. And, and the, these various keys are brilliantly designed. And this blame bow really reminds me of the lock and key and the various keys and things like that. So I'm excited to try this, almost irrespective of the whiskey itself. More about the story behind it and the keys and the bottle comes with a key and things like that. I think it's so cool. And I would love to get a bottle of it if I can. I think when I'm next to America, that's what I'm gonna try and find. Um, so the non-age statement is about $50. Whereas the 22 year old, which is what uh, Andrew's very kindly sent me, is, is retailing for about 150. And it's it's another one of these where it's kind of like Diageo just kind of pushing the, the price a little bit. Now, what they do say, and I'm gonna have to get my iPod out for this, is with the no statement, they make no indication as to where they're sourcing their stock from. However, with the um, 22 year old, they're actually a little bit more obvious about it without actually saying it. So let me just pull this up because I'm going to read you what the official line is. So their um, official notes are, it's inclusive of whiskies distilled at both the distillery historically located at 17th and Breckenridge in Louisville, Kentucky, and the distillery historically located at 1001 Wilkinson Boulevard in Frankfort, Kentucky. That means nothing to me, to be perfectly honest, but fortunately this website where I'm reading it from, turn around and say, this is the from the Blenheim Distillery and Buffalo Trace. So this is 22 year old, possibly more, because if you put the age statement on, it has to be, that's the youngest that's in it, from Blenheim, and which is Louisville, and uh, Buffalo Trace, which is in Frankfurt. So I'm extremely interested to see what this is like, because 22 year old is old for a bourbon. It's released at 46%. So they have cut it down, but I'll be very interested to see because I'm trying to think if I've had a bourbon as old as this. I don't think I have, to be perfectly honest. There is a danger though, because bourbon matures faster. Kentucky particularly, the, the climate is a lot more humid, a lot um, a lot hotter than the UK, not that that's difficult. You know, we're in our summer, we've had three days on the trot where it's been roasting hot, that's probably it, that's done for the year now. Um, but they lose a lot more stock through um, the angel share, through evaporation, through the cask. So bourbon tends really, very rarely tends to go past 15 year old before it gets released because they've either lost too much or it just becomes too woody. So I'd be very interested to see what this is like because this, this is old for a bourbon, not in terms of scotch, which is like 30, 40 years old and keeps on going, but for bourbon, to get past 20 is an achievement. And this does smell woody. <laughs> There's a bit of fire in there. It smells more than the 46%, which it is. It's quite fiery on the nose as well. I'd have said this is probably closer to 50. But there's there's definite uh, you know wood influence on this. <coughs> I 
<coughs> Jesus. <laughs> that wasn't the whiskey. <clears throat> that was me. Not swallowing properly. Oh, it suddenly kicked back up. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, when you get to older whiskies, you would, you naturally would expect them to mellow and soften. And there is a point, and I've mentioned it previously, where I did a tasting of Bumal whiskies, and I went, I think it was 10, 15, 17, 21, 25, and 30. And you could see the progression where the 10 was quite fiery, young, tight, bags of flavor, but just still young. The 15 was fantastic, it, it mellowed out, everything was complex. The 17, top draw, but more 17 year old, amazing stuff. Complex, long, loads of flavor, dancing on your tongue, doing loads of stuff, finish went on for hours. 21, all those flavors were there, but it was just dying off a bit. It just wasn't quite there. 25, started to lose it a bit. 30, not a patch on the 17. And you could see this progression of, Re, you know, good, good, really, really, really good, and then just losing it to, like, too long in cask. It's losing all the flavors. It's just dying off a bit. So you would expect the twenty-two-year-old, a twenty-two-year-old bourbon. Personally, I would have expected it to either really mellow out and be soft and complex and rich and just you, you know mature, for want of a better word. Whereas this, this is oaky and woody and tight and fiery and I wonder whether it's had too much in cask. There is an old raisiny, it's, it's, a, it's like a concentration of raisins on the nose. But it, it's, it's not new raisins, it's almost like a raisin compote that's been kind of stewing for a long time. And slightly leathery as well, but it's, it's still, it's Wood is the dominating influence. And on the palate, there is fruitiness there, but it's really knocked into the background by this overbearing oakiness that's there. I want to take that woodiness away because underneath where the fruity layer is, it's almost like it's a load of oak on top of this raisiny, plummy, damson, jam, Christmas cakey, concentrated jelliness underneath. And I want to shift all this wood out of the way and just have that bit because there's this underlying flavor of concentrated dark fruits, which is absolutely lovely. You're not helping, dog. Wait, Harley. I know it's hot, mate, but I'm the one supposed to be drinking at the moment. You can have that one and finish. But there's too much wood in the way. It's such a shame. I've got a tiny little drop. I'm gonna put the tiniest, tiniest little drop of water. Just to see if that does anything. I'm hoping it takes it all away. Oh no, what, what, whoa. In fact, it's got even more woody on the nose. That is like taking a deep sniff of uh, fresh logs on a fire before you set fire to it. Put too much water in. I put too much water in, it's just diluted it too much, but there's still wood coming through. And if anything, it's a cleaner wood feel. Bit of a disappointment, that. Such a shame. I was really looking forward to that. I really had my hopes up. And $150 is a lot of money. It's just not for me, unfortunately. I'd be very interested to try the no age statement. I think that might even have a better chance. I think, I think this is just overaged. I think it's just too long in casks and it's just picking up too much of a wood influence, which is dominating the underlying flavors, which I think would be absolutely brilliant if it wasn't for this overbearing woodiness in there. Ah, oh, bugger. But the bottle looks good, so I'd be tempted by it. No, I think I'm gonna try, try the no age statement. I'm gonna get myself a bottle of it because I think it looks fantastic and I want it on my shelf. And I think that might be a better shout than the 22, to be honest. 
So yes, thank you, Andrew. It was fascinating to try, and I am very, very honored for you to actually send it to me, knowing how much it is. Um, if you have the standard no age statement, I'd love to know what you think of it. I'm not expecting a sample of that. I'm gonna buy a bottle of myself. Um, but yes, overaged bourbon. It's a shame. Anyway, next one should probably be a scotch. I've got a couple of bourbons on the way, and then the one after that is the halfway point. Bloody halfway. And I should have some good news for you all as well. Right, I'll see you at the next one. Cheers.